here we are at March, and there's a lot of tension now between Europe and the United States um, over all sorts of issues. Um, towards the end of last month, February, there was an annual Munich Security Conference, and its theme was what they termed Westlessness, by which they meant that the West as a whole was having less of a presence in the world in terms of leadership. And two things were really going on there. One is that the Trump administration has retreated from global leadership. But the second aspect there is that Brussels and the European Union have not really stepped up to replace the Trump administration. So there's something of a sort of vacuum um, in terms of the, the Western leadership of the so-called free world. And there's a question mark in two senses, I think, about what's happening. One is how serious this divide is. And the second is whether it's just an artifact of the Trump administration or whether there's something deeper going on about America and Europe drifting apart. So to deal with the first issue, Trump's foreign policy, I think you can actually say, does have some merits to it. Like Wagner's operas, it's better than it sounds in many ways. And so even though there's been a lot of concern about Washington's commitment to NATO and to collective security, actually the Trump administration, in terms of the substance of what it's doing, rather than the president's rhetoric, has seemed to be pretty committed even now. So, for example, the Trump budget for 2020 is putting $5.9 billion worth into what it terms a European defense, a European deterrent initiative, which is designed to protect in particular the Eastern European states from the threat posed by Moscow. So there is still concern about just how much Trump is really committed to Europe and how far he's concerned much more about deals than ideals that his whole attitude is that Europe is essentially a security consumer and not a provider. And it's true that still most European members of NATO are not even meeting the 2% target in terms of 2% of their GDP being given to defense. Nonetheless, in terms of substance, the, U the US commitment to Europe seems pretty strong even now. Where there's more problems is really in many ways the non-defense areas. So on trade, the Trump administration has done what it's done essentially to everyone in the world, which is to weaponize trade policy, try to threaten Europe with retaliatory tariffs if it doesn't get its way. And on issues such as climate change, on Iran, on migration, um, essentially, there's a vast gulf now between Washington and Brussels. Trump famously said that he was elected to represent Pittsburgh, not Paris. And he pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords. He's refused to um, reenact um, American commitment on issues of climate change. On Iran, it's clear that he wants to pursue a much more maximalist pressure-oriented strategy than the more multilateral one that Europe favours. He's torn up, essentially, the Iran nuclear deal that Barack Obama negotiated in 2015, even though his European allies, including London, still want to preserve it. So there's a vast gulf that's emerged between America and, and Europe now. The second element that I think is the most interesting one is, though, whether this is just about Trump or whether there's a more fundamental conflict going on that's taking Europe and America further and further apart. Some years ago, a writer called Robert Kagan described the difference between America and Europe as being between Mars and Venus, that essentially, for all their differences, Democrats and Republicans saw the world the same way and saw it in a much more Martian world than the Venusian Europeans did. There's now some questions over that. It may be that it's the Republicans who are from Mars and the Democrats and Europeans are from Venus together. But even so, it's worth pausing to think, what will happen if Trump isn't re-elected in November? Will things be fundamentally different? And I think there's reason to think, maybe not, actually. Bernie Sanders, for example, should he become the Democratic nominee and should he win the election, basically has the same attitudes to trade 
as Trump did. In fact, he's more hostile than Trump. He's voted against, in his Senate record, every major trade deal that has come up uh, on the floor. And in terms of defense commitments, again, much more so than Trump, he's committed to slashing the defense budget in order to pay for his domestic priorities. So we could face a situation there where not only is a Sanders administration even less likely than the Trump one to want to come to Europe's aid in the case of a serious security crisis, under Sanders the US may not even have the manpower and the personnel and the platforms to do that if he gets his way. So what we may be looking at may be a more fundamental divergence as America turns increasingly inward, as Asia, and particularly the rise of China, becomes its priority, and as Europe itself is internally divided over what to do. Do you stand by the US against China, or do you do, as a lot of European states have already done, basically look at all the commercial opportunities that China offers and go in that direction? So for those of us who are looking at this wondering, is this just about Trump? I think there's good reason to think, no, it's not. And we may actually be in for more continuity than change, regardless of what happens this November.